So, I'm Hiko Simon, and this is... Rochelle Kapp. And we are back with another episode of How Not to Screw Up in Japan. And uh, the next topic, Rochelle has had no warning of whatsoever. It's just going to spontaneously come out like, bang! It's just going to shock and surprise. It's going to be um, how... When you're an executive expat getting off the airplane, I love this image. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many of these people. They get off the airplane with the hat and the sunglasses and the pipe. <laughs> and they're ready to take over and fix this broken country. And they, they leave broken people. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how to be successful. What, what are the things to be careful of and how to be successful as an executive expat being sent to Japan? Right. Okay, so I'm a local hire. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm a Japanese speaker. Uh -huh. I'm on Japanese poverty wages and I am <laughs> in, in the trenches with the rest of the people. And I, I have been in situations where there's been Mr. Getting It All Wrong, uh, overpaid foreigner in Big House who's been sent to the project site. And he's either asked or someone said, give that guy a clue. <laughs> and I've had to go up and help expats get a clue or adjust mm -hmm. or fit in. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many disaster patterns of people coming in and, and you know sometimes they turn it around sometimes they they, they don't they fade <laughs> um, but it's kind of funny I mean there are certain patterns that I see over and over mm -hmm. um, and these are people who I think need the sort of help that you can provide but I'm kind of interested in talking to you so from a perspective of an expat you're basically basically an executive expat being sent over with mm -hmm. leadership responsibility right. being sent to Japan they come over, I know they come over, they're, they're being brought over to Japan to lead and to give direction right, and to right. fix all the problems that are perceived with Japan. And they want to come and, you know, and they, they, they're there to get results and they've got this plan 12 months from now, I'm going to make this report to my CEO how I transform the country. They got good results, right? And that's why they're executives, that's why they got to be there. Right, so, and they're very good at doing that in their own context, right? So they arrive mm -hmm. and obviously they succeed mm -hmm. and that's how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, what what happens to these people? They get they get off the plane and they arrive in Japan. What 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 are the you know these people and these people are on professional contracts with goals and evaluations right. and, and targets. So there's a lot of pressure off the plane to come and have an immediate impact and to be seen to be changing stuff. Right. So, what's your advice? So you've got someone who's about to go to Japan in a week from now and do mm -hmm. this to go and right. turn around the Japan operations. What, what are your pointers for them first, for the first phase, for the getting off the plane phase? Well, I would say to spend a lot more time talking to people. And listen, you know, again, it's that listening idea. Yeah. And you know, there's this book that's been real popular in the U.S. called The First 90 Days. The First 90 Days. Yeah, and so for leaders who are taking over an organization, what should they do in the first 90 days of their job? Yeah. And a lot of it is go around and talk everyone, to everyone and listen to them. And I feel like that's a particularly effective thing to do in the Japanese environment because typically the local people feel like these people blow in and with their preconceived <laughs> ideas and don't listen to us. Yeah. So if you spend time listening, you'll, you'll help to get rid of that perception, but you also might learn something that will help you execute better. I find that's often the second 90 days. Ah. <laughs> it's sort of with the, the, the regrouping phase when they realize I that, wait a minute, it, I thought it was all working, I thought everyone was happy. And, it's it not, wasn't, yeah, and I've got to right. start again, and then they start listening. Oh, yeah, but then, then you've already created the bad first impression. And oh, then the bad first yeah. impressions are unavoidable. I'm sorry, if you're getting <laughs> sent to Japan tomorrow, you are going to create unbelievably bad impressions. Although, let's be honest, people will come up to you when you arrive. People will be looking to take advantage of the situation of your arriving to affect changes that they've always wanted. Ah, and yeah. They see the they see the the uh, foreign bull bull in the china shop boss as an opportunity. Right, right, right. Let's get sort of to change, you know, to push him things. in that direction and break that china over there. And they'll right? come straight up to you and they'll say, "Yeah, well, there's always been, you know, you have to do this, man." And and don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. <laughs> but these are the only people who talk to you in the beginning, right? Right, they're, right, they're, right. They're the, they're your, they, they they look like your best friends. You gotta be so careful. I know people get totally bamboozled. Yeah, yeah. But that's true. If you're going to talk to people, you have to talk to everyone. Because you will want to talk to, oh, well, and let's face it, we, a lot of people who get sent to Japan are quick, decisive decision makers right. who will make decisions about people's capability, right. about people's intelligence, about people's, you know, who's got a clue and who doesn't. And they'll make snap judgments about that. And often, unless you've spoken multiple languages or lived in other cultures before, you'll automatically and intuitively be extremely biased 
towards people who you feel you can relate to who have lived outside. Right, or people, just people who speak English well. Or, you know, just be, be, rate people in direct proportion how good their English is. Yeah. Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. So well, easy to do, though. And dangerous, I can pick it two ways. Dangerous in the sense that, yes, you, you, you're going to get a donkey, basically, who is giving you a bad advice. But speaks really good English. That speaks really good English. Um, and the, the, gener- the, the resentment that it generates. Um, right, right, because everyone, everyone else doesn't like that guy, yeah. Uh, and okay, so, so you've gotten off the plane, you've started issuing directives, you've had a few good ambush meetings to, uh, to, to get people into line and show them who's boss. You've, got your, you've found your lieutenant who speaks excellent English and is telling you everything you need to know. And oh, boy. <laughs> what, so what are the signs that things are starting to not go well? Do you think? Um, well, just the things you thought people were going to do, they don't do them. Mm-hmm. That'll well, they, happen they, a lot. They're going to get back to you. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, they don't have time. Mm-hmm. When you want to see people, they, they don't. Right, right, exactly. People are avoiding you. They're not talking to you, exactly. But it's so hard to tell that things aren't going well when the view from the window is so great. <laughs> you're, just look, you're just looking at Things sound lovely, and people tell you what you, what you want to hear, too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And whenever you ask what's going on on projects, it's all fine. It's all right, good. Right, right, exactly, it's all exactly, fine. Yeah. Uh, and again, I know these situations where, and then Foreigner does the report back to headquarters in perfect English. Oh, everything, actually, the team's working really hard and everything. And then they find out, you know, the next day that they weren't getting all the information. And, and so they look like, you know, fools to the people abroad and in, uh, and in Japan. Doesn't look good, now. So, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you as well... <laughs> Having worked in a number of foreign companies where expats fly in and out, uh, yeah, it's funny. You, you're motivated. You got all. You, you really. They pump you up and they send you to Japan. Right. Um, with everybody, every expat gets pumped up and sent to Japan. And Japanese, you have to understand, Japanese. They, it's like watching, you know, tourists fly in and fly out again. Oh, I know, I know. Well, the they thing fold is, their I, arms and say, "Okay, let's see." Not how another far this one. Goes. What's he going to be like? Well, the thing is, I see the exact same thing at Japanese companies' operations in the U.S. Oh, right. Yeah, it's like every three years you get a new guy, and like the, the this, this one, one gonna is going like? to do the exact opposite of the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I got to train our someone up from scratch. They don't know anything about the U.S. and how we do things here. Yeah. And you get people who get tired and cynic, cynical and, and, and crabby. But you know, probably the, the difference with that is, well, I've been in Japan this whole time. Although I have worked for an expat Japanese boss in New Zealand mm-hmm. as well, at uh-huh. a, albeit at a souvenir shop, uh, <laughs> but at one owned by a uh, Tokyo Corporation, so uh-huh. he was a Tokyo guy. Uh-huh. Um, but um, a lot of those bosses, when they get, you know, and some see it as a kind of an exile sometimes as well when they get sent abroad. Uh, right, right. You know, they, they, they'll they just lock themselves in their office and sit at their desk and let the company run itself. Sometimes. If you're, sometimes. You know, sometimes they'll do that, but then sometimes they'll come in and they'll micromanage everything and they'll change uh, it all. So okay. you, get, you get a whole variety. Yeah. So I think this is something really, um, it's not just foreign firms in Japan. I think it's all multinationals have this problem. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of natural when you're taking someone who is developed in a totally different context and right. has come up and has authority and is being told to go and exercise authority. Right. I mean, what know, are they going to do? They're going to do what they're told, right? Yeah. I know. It's, it, it's like filling water balloons, you know, on, on top of a really tall building and just, you know, it's just taking turns, having fun lobbing them off and seeing the same result. I mean, but that said, expats do occasionally turn it around. Right. And I've seen some people do dramatic transformations. Uh how do you turn it around? When you feel, you, you, there's a certain point, you, hit that, you have that optimistic point, you have the low point, it's like right, the phases right, right. of grief, right? Right, 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 exactly. Or like, or like that honeymoon period, right? You know, he's kind of like, oh, I'm so excited, oh, everything's terrible, and it's how do you bring it back up, right? How do, how do you bring it back up? So you've just hit that, okay, everyone hates me, I'm irrelevant, I'm never going to get anything done, and this whole assignment to Japan is just going to be the end of my career. How do you turn it around when, you, when you're going through all those realizations? Well, that's, well, that's one, again, maybe that's the second 90 days when people are going and talking to people. You have to, you have to listen to people and you have to find out what's actually going on and what yeah. people really think and really get to the bottom if you're trying to turn around an organization of what were really the problems. Yeah. And not just the superficial thing that the one guy told you, but what really is going on. Yeah. And it takes some work to dig to that and you've got to build trust with people. Yeah. One of my favorite... So I, 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 one of my favorite uh, cases of working with an expat was I was on one of the biggest IT disaster projects. Uh, I, when I used to work in, an, I used to do SAP in a big IT consulting uh-huh. com- company when I first came to Japan. And I was one of the worker bees getting, you know, working all night and people were dying from working to death on, on projects that oh my, my co-workers were on. 
Uh, I was lucky, only mental breakdowns and hospitalizations on my projects. Um, <laughs> and I was on the worst one. I was on, you know, basically, for anyone who does SAP, um, they'll know what I mean when I say that this project had 6,000 add-ons, <laughs> which... I don't do SAP, but that sounds not, pretty bad. It's not physical. It's, it, people would think it's not physically possible. They literally... It, a, it was a child of Frankenstein system that we were making. Mm, okay. it, it was like taking... <laughs> Windows and re recoding all of Windows to do it all again, but in DOS add-on programs. It was, just, uh, it was a horrible, horrible. It was a complete, it was a real disaster. And it was a famous disaster. And also the company that I was in, which eventually divorced, the Japanese and the foreign company broke apart uh, because they were at war with each other at the time. Nice. And part of the reason was, was that the American company had a habit of sending failure expats over to Japan for redemption, um, which was reinforcing the failures. And it wasn't until just before the end they realized that, oh, we need to send our good guys over there because the Japanese were, were resenting the fact that they were getting these screw-ups being sent over oh, to Japan. Oh, and they just figured out that at the end. Oh, dear. Disaster upon disaster. Oh, that sounds pretty bad. But so they finally send a good guy over, uh -huh. actually, a, a competent guy who, who is a troubleshooter guy who comes up to the, the worst project you've ever, you've ever heard of. And he sits in on these management meetings, doesn't speak a word of Japanese, but he's got two translators beside him. And uh -huh. you see a you know, big guy sitting in these meetings, meeting with 30 people at the table, uh, all the big Microsoft, IBM, you know, NEC, you know, all big consulting companies and so on, all sitting at this big table with this client. And one by one, the client's talking, the old middle major, and they're shouting and they're banging the table. And all the, all, the, all, the client, all the vendor companies, guys, are asleep at the table. This is a three-hour meeting, and this is held once a week, the, the, the weekly management meeting. Uh, the clients are there complaining and shouting, and, and these guys are, you know, some of them are listening and nodding, and some of them are kind of dozing off. And you have this non-Japanese speaker guy who's thrown into this meeting and he looks at this meeting and he's seeing these very animated angry clients and, and these totally completely passive, disengaged yeah. and passive vendors and it's like oh my god you know we have to get a handle on this so uh white man in the back there's a there's a white man in the room i need that white man and i was the only white guy in the project apart from him you know and i i, I was one of the worker bees but they pulled me out uh, he pulled me out specifically and he said i need you to sit in the meeting with me and translate for me what's going on mm -hmm. okay so then one of the uh Japanese delivery leads came up to me when he went away and said, okay, listen, <laughs> we're not particularly proud of all the things that we've done on this project, but we've reached some very finely balanced compromises and situations that I can't have someone coming in who doesn't understand all of these nuances and, and opening up all these old issues. Mm. So I need you, when you're in there translating for him, not to translate if it's about this or this or this Ooh. or this. I was get, I, I'm, I'm just a worker bee and I've been told not to translate what's oh, going no. on to this guy. Oh, no. But I was kind of like, well, what am I supposed to do? Translate gibberish? Am I supposed to make up movie subtitles? I, mean, you know. <laughs> I know, that's a really bad position to put you in. <laughs> it's a terrible position to be put in, but it, it, was, it was a growth experience. But anyway, so I did. I took the guy, I took the guy aside. I explained all the nuances to him or whatever. I, I, you know, I, I, I coached him and got him up to speed. On top of doing my own job, but simultaneously translating for three hours in the middle of the day and then oh. going back to programming oh, ouch. when your brain is yeah, like yeah, brain, brain, brain overload, yeah. But anyway, I figured out the best way to simultaneously translate because I don't have that skill of being able to disassociate my voice from my ear. So no, I can't, no, 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 that's so, hard to do. But I can type super fast. So mm -hmm. I could type like on a screen and use it as a teleprompter for the guy and tra simultaneously translate on a screen everything that's being said in oh, the meeting. Oh, that's a good idea. So the funniest thing was, of all the things that, it, it, he started to realize that, well, the clients are shouting and banging the table and they're very upset and they're demanding this and all these guys are asleep. Um, the things that they are saying are ridiculous. These, these are all 70-year-old you know, produ you know, production line leads. They have keyboards that were designed in the 1970s for mainframes with special buttons and stuff on them. And they're saying, uh, you know, and they're just making ridiculous requests. That, and that's how it got to be like this, basically. Oh, okay. I remember the, my favorite one was once these guys were saying, oh, yeah, we're almost done. Microsoft, where's Microsoft? Oh, Microsoft, uh, you know. Microsoft, I've noticed... Look, all of the guys on the production line, we've established, we've set up the, the user interface so you don't have to use a mouse because our guys won't know how to use a mouse, okay? <laughs> and we've set up the computer thing so you use our special customized keyboard from the 1970s with buttons that don't exist on normal keyboards and we've got it all customized so it will work with the new system and that's good. Um, we've also made a colored version of the green screen, but the screens are exactly the same as on the green screen, so we're happy with that. But there's something I noticed. I was testing it the other day and I noticed that at the top of the screen, there's this bar, and at the end there are these three boxes. There's a, there's a cross, and a square, and a line. And what are those? The Microsoft guy says, those are windows. Okay, Microsoft, I need you to take the windows out. <laughs> oh, no. And the Microsoft guy, I don't know how, how Browbeaten had been up to this point, but 
he agreed to take the windows out of windows. <laughs> it was just, how do you even do that? I don't know, but they did it. This is how we had a brighter Frankenstein system. Oh, that sounds pretty bad. And so, you know, it was a whole project. But the funny thing was, so I'm firing my brain just translating, trying to keep up. And, you know, uh, and it's kind of funny. The more that he got the hang of what was going on, the more uh -huh. that he understood what was happening, and the more he realized how much all the shouting and everything was kind of frivolous. One day I'm typing, you know, and I can hear him snoring next to me. <laughs> Oh no, he's falling asleep too. He fell asleep too, and so I just typed <laughs> on the screen, dude, you are becoming more and more Japanese every day. <laughs> and I just left it there. And 10 minutes later, hand on the shoulder, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but uh, the, the true sign that he fully understood what was happening, he became a it fully integrated expert, but he was falling asleep in the meetings as well. That's too funny. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough to be an expert here. The problem is, is that really what success is, um, and this is where I've seen expats that I consider to be successful here, mm -hmm. um, that have invested the time, that have gone and the, the, you know, done all the, invested all the personal time and built the trust right. relationships and actually finally have a clue and finally are doing things with the mm -hmm. nuance. But the problem is because nuance is so important mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and people stop seeing the dramatic change that they wanted when they sent the guy over and right, the guys right. don't get, the best guys don't get evaluated the way that they deserve. Yeah, I know, yeah. But yet the fact that they're not being so spectacular, but they're being taken seriously, which is kind of taken for granted uh, from the outside, that's actually the big, biggest sign of greatest success. Exactly, exactly. But and it's hard, to, it's hard to show that off to the people at the headquarters. It yeah. is, it is. And I, you know, I, 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 I rave about people who get to that point, but it's funny, they, they, they get yanked out and, and sent off to some obscure country as a punishment. Oh, okay, well, don't say that, because then <laughs> no, no, everyone no, no, who's you... watching this is going to be discouraged and not do the right thing. So. Well, some small countries are very nice. They have some very nice <laughs> climates in places like Fiji. No, I mean, no, that's right. I mean, the question is, to start to be effective, the first thing is not to be a disaster in Japan, because then you're going to be a disaster everywhere. Yeah. The second thing is to be a success in Japan. And the third thing is to be a success in Japan and get other people to understand what success in Japan means. Means. And what's really possible here. Yeah. And that's the hardest part. Right. Uh, honestly speaking. And it's funny. In, uh, in my experience, the most successful expats, the biggest, the hardest job they have is not dealing with the Japanese. It's dealing with their headquarters. It's dealing with their headquarters to get them to have the same clue that took them months to get when they got here themselves. Exactly. Well, I hear the same thing from the Japanese who are in the U.S. reporting back to the headquarters in Japan. Oh, it's yeah. definitely a multinational thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's natural, isn't it? But yeah. yeah. This is fascinating, but we said we'd do five minute shows and they're all super long, but that's because they're super interesting, right? I mean, this is she great? Uh -huh. So we're gonna do a couple more episodes uh, in the time that we have left before they kick us dragging and screaming upon these beautiful sofas. I love this space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned next week for another episode of How Not to Screw Up in Japan. <laughs>